All right, good morning. Uh, welcome, another fine day. Uh, ILM 310302I, differential pressure flow elements is the topic of the day. Objectives today, uh, explain the principles and applications of differential pressure elements. So we'll look at all kinds of different uh, differential pressure uh, creating elements. Identify components uh, of differential pressure elements, and they're mostly different types of elements, but similar, uh, similar features that we're going to look at. Explaining the installation requirements for differential pressure elements, which was uh, used to be a pretty significant por portion of uh, this ILM, and, and it still it still is. Uh, describe the maintenance and calibration processes for differential pressure elements, which is pretty straightforward. I think we've probably basically covered this already. Uh, explain the advantages and limitations of differential pressure elements. So again, this is going to be able to. Uh, this is going to be uh, where you can differentiate between the different types of elements and what they're good at and what they're not so good at. So let's start out with the principles of differential pressure measurement here. Um, one of the oldest flow measuring methods is differential flow. By placing a restriction in the process stream, we can generate a high pressure and a low pressure area in the pipe. And when we put the restriction in, as we see in the diagram here at the orifice plate, you can see by our little pressure line here that the area just in front of the orifice plate creates a high pressure area and the area just after the orifice plate creates a low pressure area and this gives us a, a, an amount of pressure loss across the front and back of that orifice plate and this is the dynamic or the physics I guess that we use in order to uh, determine the differential pressure so this is the basic uh, principle of operation here is that uh, differential between the high side of the obstruction and the low side of the obstruction and it doesn't much matter what the obstruction is it just has to be some type of uh, an obstruction so we're focusing mostly on elements uh, in this ilm so we'll talk about that for a second here a primary element by definition is the device in the process that generates the differential uh, commonly an orifice plate um, but we're not speaking about orifice plates in specific terms in this ILM, uh, although in this PowerPoint there is a section at the back uh, that is still existing from the previous version of the ILM that I decided, as I told you earlier, I wasn't going to take out uh, because I thought that orifice plates being as common as they are, uh, it's nice to have that information just as a, a review or a refresher. Secondary element is the device that is used to measure this differential pressure and most times it's a transmitter and specifically a differential pressure transmitter. So looking at the math associated with differential pressure, the relationship between differential pressure and flow for liquids is shown using this magical formula here for liquids and this magical formula here for gas. Um, we're not doing any math at all in this ILM here, but what is important to recognize in both of these equations is this little square root sign right here, uh, and that's really the pivot pin when we're talking about differential pressure measuring flow, is that it is the only type of flow measurement that we deal with that requires square root extraction, and that's a function of uh, the orifice plate and the uh, differential pressure that's that's generated here obviously so mathematically this is where we get that information here so the delta p as we saw in the previous uh, equations there has a squared relationship with flow in order to convert it into a linear relationship we'll either use charts or a square root extractor and you may have heard that term square root extractor before uh, the good news is that most transmitters have square root extraction built in as an option, so you'll not likely ever see a chart in your life. Daniel Bernoulli here, the guy who came up with this uh, theory on differential pressure, just throwing him in there for a little bit of fun. Element components, is that where we are? Yes, it is. So element components, there are a number of mechanical elements that could be used to generate the differential pressure required for flow measurement, as I said earlier. We are going to look at in this order venturi tubes, flow nozzles, pitot tubes, annu bars, and venturi cones. These first five are contained 
uh, as material in your ILM. Uh, the last one here, orcus plates, uh, I have in brackets here, studied earlier, meaning that we're assuming that you studied this, I'm guessing, in, in second year. However, I have left uh, about eight slides at the end of the PowerPoint that are related to these orcus plates. And yes, uh, because I'm leaving them in here, I would say that it's fair that I could test you on that material. So let's start out by looking at venturi tubes here off page six. Uh, here's some pictures of a venturi tube. And if you haven't clicked into it right away, I know this diagram is a little bit different than the one uh, in the ILM, but it's very similar. Uh, the venturi tubes are uh, a large manufactured piece of equipment and they are, uh, they're large. Let's just say that that's their, that's probably their biggest problem is that they're large, but let's look at some of the details uh, with the venturi tube. So per, they pass approximately 60% more flow than an orifice plate. So a similar uh, orifice plate, of course, would have much more of a restriction uh, inside the pipe itself. Uh, as you see in the diagram of the venturi tube here, the restriction is actually not that small. Uh, we have a larger piece of pipe throating down to a smaller area and then gradually uh, increasing again in diameter as it um, as it comes out of the uh, low pressure side. Uh, and as a result of the fact that it has this larger area in the pipe, it can pass more flow than an orifice plate. It has the lowest amount of pressure drop. Uh, and again, the relationship between pressure drop and pipe diameter is something that you need to understand here. The smaller, uh, the smaller hole or the more restriction that we place in the flow stream, the greater pressure drop it's going to create. Um, pressure drop is great for measuring, but pressure drop is not great for pumping. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on here. As we go through these uh, different elements, um, I basically just highlighted the high points uh, out of the ILM here. So uh, the pros and the cons basically. Um, Accuracy is something that you're going to see as we go through the different elements here. So this one has a stated accuracy of about three quarters of a percent uh, for specific Reynolds numbers that are greater than 100,000. And we'll spend a little bit more time in a different ILM uh, talking about Reynolds numbers. But as a review, I think you have talked about Reynolds numbers uh, in a previous year of training. But this has to do with describing the, the flow profile. And you may remember terms like uh, turbulent and transitional and laminar and things like that. And that relates to the Reynolds number and the, and the condition of the flow as it goes through. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the, the importance of uh, fully developed flow uh, a little bit in this ILM. Venturi tubes have shorter upstream requirements than, should be than orifice plates. So anything on this side uh, of the restriction uh, would be shorter than that you would find uh, in an orifice plate, and we'll we'll develop that uh, concept a little bit as we move through the different types of devices. Um, what we're going to be looking for uh, when we get to the installation section here is how many of these upstream requirements or downstream requirements uh, are are in play, and and what does it mean? And basically, all it's all it's re, uh, referring to is the amount of uh, piping that we have in front. Uh, or, or upstream of our element, um, it has to be such that we get a decently developed flow coming into the element in order for the element to work correctly. So different elements will have different upstream requirements and downstream requirements. And you'll see those listed as specifications as we look at the different devices. Okay, these can handle dirty fluids. Uh, again, one of the physical characteristics of the flow, or I'm mean, sorry, the venturi tube flow uh, profile is that there's no ridges or real uh, impingement on the flow. So there's, you know, if we were looking at an orifice plate here, there would be dead zones uh, above and below the hole in the orifice plate where dirt and things can collect. Um, that's one of the pros of a venturi tube is it doesn't have that. So as a result, it can handle uh, dirty fluids. Uh, better than, say, an orifice plate. Uh, reduced pumping cost compared to orifice plates. So again, I mentioned earlier, pressure drop 
uh, when we have pressure drop and we're transporting uh, some kind of uh, fluid, we have to make up that pressure drop somewhere and that comes from the pump. Uh, and in order to make up that pressure drop, we have to increase energy to the pump, which costs uh, us more in energy. So um, trying to get the one with the lowest pressure drop will ideally get the most pumping efficiency, but it doesn't necessarily get you uh, the sensitivity that you need. And you'll see that as we look at some of these other uh, elements here. So what are the disadvantages uh, of a venturi? Well, they're large. Um, a six inch venturi is about eight feet long. So once you design a piping system and you put a venturi in it, you're going to need a lot of pipe, first of all. And second of all, if you're gonna change it in any way, shape or form, you're very stuck with the, the size of the uh, venturi tube that you've got. So you may have to um, modify a bunch of piping if you're changing sizes, if you've calculated wrong. Differential pressure created by the venturi is lower than that of an orifice plate, so a more sensitive transmitter is needed. Uh, this point is kind of moot um, because typically, if we say, for example, we're using a, a rose mount 3051, they're accurate enough uh, and rangeable enough that that generally doesn't come into play. Bulky and more expensive, again, based on uh, sheer size and amount of material and fabrication that goes into them uh, compared to an orifice plates. Specifically, they're definitely uh, far more bulky and more expensive. As I said earlier, they, they can't be resized. It's built, it's a spool piece basically, uh, and you can't resize it easily. Um, and that's kind of the, the major downside of the Venturi. So that's Venturi's next element that we're gonna look at is a, a flow nozzle. Uh, and we'll look at the pros and cons of flow nozzles uh, relative to the um, orifice plate and the venturi. And each of these elements has, has a place, obviously. Um, so distinguishing where you're going to use what type of an element is one of the objectives in this ILM. Okay, so here's a flow nozzle. And before we get going here, just look at it physically, what it kind of looks like here. Uh, you'll see we have these uh, a rounded sort of nozzle sort of sort of shape, kind of like a jet engine. Uh, same physics occurs here. We get this as a restriction generating a high side here and a low side here. And you'll see that we have pipe taps um, with some measurement here, one diameter uh, upstream, half a diameter downstream, uh, specifically for a flow nozzle. This is our high pressure tap point and our low pressure tap point, and they're fairly standard across uh, elements, um, but there is some specificity uh, regarding the measurements or how many diameters upstream and downstream, and that is again talking to uh, the ins installation requirements and the uh, upstream and downstream requirements of some of these devices. So if we look at this uh, in comparison to orifice plates and venturi nozzles, you'll see that this is kind of uh, a bit of both. Okay, we get a lower permanent pressure loss than an orifice, uh, but a little bit higher than a venturi. We're, and that's pretty easy to see. If we had an orifice plate, we'd have a small hole in the center here, which would cause much more pressure loss. If we had the venturi, we wouldn't have any of this stuff in here, which would be much lower uh, pressure loss. And this one is kind of, like it says, a, a combination of both. So it gets the combination of, of both in terms of pressure loss, so somewhere in between an orifice and a venturi. Differential pressure is lower than that of an orifice plate, but higher than that of a venturi. Again, based on the same uh, basic principles here, it doesn't create quite as much upstream pressure because this hole is a little bit bigger. Uh, as a result, the differential across them isn't quite as big, so you get a little bit of a uh, smaller um, range, I guess, of differential pressure. These are good for high velocity fluid and steam flows. They are more rugged and more uh, erosion resistant than orifice plates. Again, no sharp edges here to wear out. Uh, so this is kind of one of those physical characteristics that um, makes them a little bit more uh, rugged and erosion resistant than orifice plates. So that is flow nozzles. Next element uh, moving into the more primitive scale here are called pitot tubes. 
and uh, cartoon style drawing of the pedo tube. Let's have a look if it's any better in the ILM. Not really. Um, pedo tubes, for those of you who think you may not have ever seen one before, do have some common non-industrial applications that you may be familiar with if you have a boat, for example, and the boat has a speedometer on it. You will have a pedo tube hanging off the transom of your boat. Uh, they're usually flexible and you bend them up and down, uh, but this is what is used to measure the speed in a boat. It's also used to measure the speed uh, of airplanes. So there are some non-industrial type applications for pedo tubes. These can be used in, on liquids and as gases, as illustrated by boats and airplanes. Uh, the velocity is sensed by measuring the impact pressure that comes into this nozzle. We're having flow coming from the left to right here, and we get our uh, impact pressure measured by this nozzle in, in the front, which is directly facing into the flow, and we get static pressure by uh, port taken off the side uh, of the pitot tube. The velocity is proportional to the square root of the difference between the impact pressure and the static pressure. So we count this as our high pressure port and we count this as our low pressure port. And here's a representation of kind of how that would look uh, measuring from each of these ports and the differential pressure that's created uh, with this machine. Okay, the rangeability for a pitot tube is about three to one. And this device only gives about one quarter of the differential pressure uh, of an orifice blade. Uh, and again, this is taking a relatively small sample uh, in terms of the diameter of the pipe. So that's kind of the result of that uh, physical characteristic of a pitot tube is that it does not have as much differential pressure uh, as some of the other elements that we've looked at. Okay, here's a diagram from the ILM again, just kind of putting into perspective uh, the physical uh, science behind the pitot tube here shows that the velocity pressure uh, indicated here is a combination of this total pressure minus the static pressure that we get from the static port. Um, as with most of these elements here, uh, we're looking for uh, some type of a specific flow profile and uh, for pitot tubes here, the requirement is a fully developed flow profile in order to work well. And for our purposes, what that means here basically is that the pressure across the cross-sectional area of the pipe is generally the same uh, at any area, uh, whether it's the bottom of the pipe, the center of the pipe, or the top of the pipe. If the flow is developed uh, fully, it should be relatively standard from wall to wall, and that ensures that we get accurate measurements um, from this device. So um, lots of times pitot tubes are used for, you know, air measurement, but there, uh, you know, there are again different applications that you can use a pitot tube for. Next device here is called an anubar, and an anubar is basically the same uh, idea as a pitot tube, except they are designed to uh, be used when the, the, those flow profiles that we talked about are not suitable for a single point pitot tube. So it's like having several pitot holes in a row across a duct, for example, or a pipe, and it provides the same function as an averaging pitot arrangement. Um, in the ILM, it does show an example, I believe, uh, of an averaging pitot arrangement, which would essentially uh, just be a, a pitot tube here, a pitot tube here, a pitot tube here, across the cross-sectional area um, of, the, of the piping system or ducting system. <laughs> So again, looking at the anubar here, this will insert into a duct and we have uh, impact pressure openings that are facing the flow. It's kind of a mixed up little picture here. Uh, that's the flow is coming from this way. Um, the impact or high pressure openings on the top here and the static pressure openings on the side. And you see there's a number of them here going across the duct. Uh, and what this does essentially, uh, like it says here, provides an averaging um, of the flow pressures across that uh, piping. Last but not least, uh, V-cones, uh, Venturi cone or V-cone is yet another method of measuring the uh, flow with differential pressure. Uh, high pressure area is created upstream by this big 
huge thing that's inside the flow and the diagram i don't think i have one in here no i didn't include the diagram from the ilm the diagram from the ilm on page 13 shows you uh what this looks like in real life and it is not really dissimilar from this it's kind of awkward and kind of clunky um but this thing here creates the obstruction high pressure is created by the blockage of the mass of this cone uh, we get our high pressure point somewhere upstream and we get our low pressure uh, area coming in from this area here which is sensed through the cone itself uh, this area low pressure area regardless i guess i'll throw this fancy word out there is vena contracta and that basically means this cell area of low pressure that's generated on the downside of uh, any of these uh, flow elements for that for that matter so those are the five kind of main elements that we're looking at here in third year um, and their individual characteristics uh, again these are all probably generally less common than the orifice plate um, but i'm assuming that the uh, course outline has been rewritten so that you're covering orifice plates um, more in second year or perhaps first year than uh, than you are now so moving on to the next objective then that uh, takes us into installation considerations for these different flow elements in order for these elements to operate accurately we must consider something called the flow profile as i mentioned earlier it's used to describe the amount of turbulence inside the pipe and these devices require a fully developed flow profile this means we need enough straight pipe before the element to remove turbulence. This is usually expressed in terms of upstream and downstream pipe requirements and things can get very ugly here. I remember uh, struggling with this a little bit when I was in school 30 years ago, um, but it's not as bad as it looks, although you're gonna see a whole bunch of numbers come whizzing by you here shortly. Um, Tubing connections are also important, you know, reaming out your tubing and, and things like that. Uh, minor detail, but can be important in the, in the big picture. So let's look at uh, installation requirements now for the different types of elements that we've looked at thus far. First off with Venturi tubes here. Uh, we'll talk about positioning, we'll talk about pipe requirements, and we'll talk, we'll talk about tap, lo uh, tap locations as we look at these different devices. So position, uh, horizontal, vertical, or angled. Wonderful. Uh, if liquid, vertical is preferred, and that's kind of standard, uh, and I'll talk about why that is uh, as we get uh, further in here. There's probably a better example. Uh, taps on the side, generally to prevent plugage. Piping requirements. Um, we said earlier that venturi tubes have the least amount of straight pipe requirements due to its long construction. Uh, this is relatively unique in terms of construction. Uh, venturi tubes are much, much larger than any other element. Um, the taps, uh, one quarter to a half a diameter upstream and in the middle of the throat. So here we have, uh, let's say a six inch pipe, whatever it happens to be. And you got about half of that distance here. Um, in this diagram low pressure trap middle of the uh, tap in the middle of the throat here so to compare them here uh in terms of pipe diameters this is an orifice plate and an orifice plate says that you know you need somewhere between zero and a dozen pipe diameters of pipe straight pipe in order to create that fully developed flow that we're looking for classic venturi somewhere less than five pipe diameters in order to make that flow acceptable for accurate measurement Flow nozzle, same positioning as Venturi, horizontal, vertical, angle, depending on what you like. Generally, the preferred uh, preferred is uh, vertical, and the reason for having it mounted vertically is that in order, uh, when it's mounted vertically, uh, it has to be full. There's no option for it. Like if we had a piece of pipe that came down from the high line and dropped down, and then we had a horizontal run, and then bent back up and went back into the high line, we can mount it horizontally because the, the height of the legs on both sides of the device would be full it's just by physics, right? It has, it has to be full because it has to push the fluid up this way. And that's kind of the idea behind saying we're, we want to mount it vertically. If it's mounted vertically on one of these risers, there's no way you can pump anything up a pipe vertically 
without that pipe being full. Uh, if it was in a long horizontal run, it is possible that you could only have half the pipe full with the fluid. Um, so as a general rule, at least in terms of the ILM, they say mount it vertically because there is no option uh, except for the pipe to be full if we're pumping a liquid up, up a pipe. Um, what you'll see most times in industry though is, is what I described, the pipe comes out of the high line, drops down into a U, uh, a spool of a U shape, and then goes back up into the pipeline. This achieves the same thing as mounting it vertically. Um, so as a result, you mount them horizontally in real life most times. Anyway, long drawn out. Pipe requirements, uh, basically same as the orifice plate, uh, which means somewhere between 10 and 50 pipe diameters upstream and five diameters downstream. As we move through these devices, the upstream uh, numbers are the ones that are more likely to change. The downstream requirements are pretty much five pipes, pipe diameters downstream for just about all of these devices. Um, something that we can say about not only this device, but other elements that we're gonna talk about here is that we can reduce uh, these pipe diameters with something called a pipe straightener, and we'll talk about pipe straighteners uh, a little bit later on. Okay, taps for a flow nozzle, one diameter upstream and a half a diameter from the nozzle leading edge. So here's the leading edge of the nozzle, uh, half a diameter. So if this is a 10 inch pipe, this is this is five inches, uh, whatever it happened, it happens to be. Okay, these uh, flow nozzles can be difficult to remove as it is, as it is pitched between the flanges uh, and this like the Venturi tube would usually uh, be in a removable uh, spool piece. You can see that if we had an orifice plate in, in here, of course, we can just pull it out. Um, but because of the construction of a flow nozzle, we've got a little bit of an issue there. KL type pedo tubes, pretty simple and straightforward here. These are usually done through a pipe tap and a block and, a block and bleed type mechanism here with a, a packing type bushing on it. Um, Position the nozzle facing into the flow. So flow is this way. We want our uh, high pressure nozzle leak pointing directly into that flow. Our static pressure nozzle, of course, here is on the side. Piping requirements, 10 to 15 diameters upstream. Uh, and the taps uh, are going to be part of the block manifold uh, that we be mounted on the, the device itself. Annubar installation, very similar. Uh, to the pedo tube we just discussed here again, the nozzle facing into the flow to get that impact pressure. And piping requirements, simply enough for fully developed flow. And again, taps are part of the device, and this gives a bit of a better example of what these uh, taps would look like here, a uh, valve for each, the high pressure and the uh, low pressure side here. So this is the front view of what you would see uh, as you were heading into the annu bar. V-cone, last element here in terms of installation here, position, horizontal or if vertical, the differential pressure must be zeroed on a no-flow condition. Um, so that's thrown in here, um, but that's kind of standard for all of these elements actually. Piping requirements, one to three diameters upstream, and this is the only one that works with underdeveloped flow. Um, and basically what that means is that it acts as its own straightener simply because we have this thing, this cone uh, in, in the piping itself, and it has a tendency to uh, push the flow where it needs to, needs to go and acts as its own straightener. Uh, again, uh, because these are generally a spool piece here, the taps will be uh, part of the spool itself. So low pressure side attached to the end of the cone, high pressure side on the upstream side uh, of the cone. So that's installation for uh, these flow elements. Next objective here deals with maintenance and calibration, which you will soon discover is not very intense. Um, as these elements have no moving parts, maintenance is limited to inspecting and cleaning. Uh, when we do an inspection, basically all we're doing is confirming the measurements uh, against the manufacturer's specification. And usually back in the day when we had orifice plates in here, uh, you know, we measure the, the size of the hole in the orifice plate, make sure the cutting edge is still sharp and there's no washed out areas, uh, that, type of, uh, that type of thing. Um, 
not talking about orifice plates, all of these other devices, again, because they're inside the flow stream there, uh, are subject to wear. Um, and inspecting for wear is basically uh, all we can do in terms of maintenance. Okay, when the when the measurements are out of spec, we just we just kind of replace them. You can't do much about it. Uh, cleaning is done to ensure that there's no buildups uh, that may affect the measuring accuracy of the device. And there is no calibration per se for the elements, um, but the transmitter must be calibrated. Um, and again, this calibrator transmission uh, trans calibrator ca transmitter calibration is a standard differential pressure transmitter uh, and the procedure will be exactly as it would be for measuring uh, level using a differential pressure transmitter. Okay, pros and cons of each of the devices or advantages and disadvantages as we used to, uh, as we now call them. So Venturi, what are the pros of a Venturi? Low pressure loss, which in turn gives us high pressure recovery. The cons are it's expensive, it's large, uh, used for clean, non-corrosive liquids and gases. Flow nozzle, uh, large volumes and velocities are pros, good for steam condensate, slurries, and some gases. Uh, cons, difficult to remove, uh, higher pressure loss than a Venturi, but better than an orifice. Lots of facts here. Pitot tubes, uh, pros, low cost, easy installation, low pressure loss. Cons, low accuracy, weak signal, uh, can only be used on clean stuff. They only provide a single point reading, uh, but we can overcome that by averaging or using an averaging arrangement of pitot tubes. Antibar pros provides an average representation all by itself. So it's like a, a pedo tube on steroids, basically. And chances are you'd probably, if you needed to average, uh, you would probably just use an anti-bar rather than a bunch of pedo tubes. Uh, easy installation, cons, uh, just like a pedo tube, uh, weak signal, uh, and can only be used for clean stuff. Again, very small holes uh, on both the pedo tube and the anti-bar. V-cone. Uh, pros, low maintenance, uh, self-straightening or self-conditioning, uh, and can handle multi-phase flow, so liquids and gases. Cons, uh, requires removal for inspection, and again, removable, uh, meaning pipe fitters have to come and do that for you. Okay, the remainder of this presentation is uh, leftover orifice plate stuff that I i uh, decided not to cut out here. I'm not going to talk specifically uh, about it in the, in the presentation here, um, but I will say that this is testable material because it is very, very common. Uh, not, a lot, not a lot of stuff in here that you're going to be unfamiliar with, again, because we're assuming that you um, covered this in second year already, but this is a nice little, uh, little section on orifice plates here. Just for review. So it's only eight slides and it talks about uh, specific orifice plates and orifice plate configurations. So that is the end uh, of this slideshow, flow elements, differential flow, uh, flow elements in particular. Um, going forward from here, uh, we're going to be looking at individual um, measurement devices, so magmeters, turbine meters, uh, vortex meters, mass flow meters, all kinds of good stuff. And that is the end. <laughs>